can I first of all uh, pay tribute to the uh, Consular General from the Greek Embassy for, for coming here. We are very, very grateful for that. Uh, and, and also the President of the Morpho Association. But more important, we have a, a character here who started off life uh, as, a, as a mainstay priest in the United Kingdom when he was in Mansfield, my own constituency, many years ago. And Father Damien is, is come down from North London to share, share in tonight's uh, events, and we're very, very grateful and indeed for that. Uh, there's another person who I wanted to mention in the course of uh, my introduction, is that we have a hero's hero here tonight. We have lots of them, actually, but we've got one in particular who's known to uh, members of parliament, because he actually was one. And there's no other member of parliament, either before or since the uh, independence movement uh, arrived in the 60s concerning Cyprus, who's fought more and longer and harder than Tom Cox, so we're very grateful for him to him to work. Uh, finally, just to say that we are also very, very grateful for the people who come from uh, Morfu to share with us what's going on uh, in that part of the world at the present time, which has got to be difficult. And in particular, Bambus, the, the mayor, and other members of the council were here and known to us in, in this place for the various activities they do on behalf of not only Morfu, but also Cyprus and the Mediterranean area in general. And we're extremely grateful for their persistence on their search for uh, maintenance, uh, well, appearance and maintenance of democracy in that part of the world. And we're forever grateful that they fight in the front line, the good fight, which eventually will win the day and Cyprus will be free and will be a united country and will play a full and decent part in the European experience. So without further ado, I'll come back and say a few words later, but I'd like to first of all introduce Bambos, the, uh, the mayor of uh, Morfu, uh, Kumbari Morfitis, uh, uh, as he is described, and uh, he'll say a few words here, Bambo. <coughs> Honourable members from the British Parliament, dear Alan, me, dear representative of the Greece Embassy in the United Kingdom, dear President of Enosis Sabodimon, Peripherias Morfu, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to express our many thanks to Alan Mill and to the other member of the British Parliament for the support that they offered to us for so many years in our struggle for a just and viable solution to the Cyprus problem. <coughs> Morfu, our beloved hometown, and the large part of our, of our island is under Turkey's occupation for 40 long years. The tragic summer of 1974 has left deep, painful marks in our lives. The Turkish invited and occupied our town. They killed, raped, and destroyed everything in their path, and we were forced to run for our lives, abandoned our homes and properties, and left everything behind <coughs> us. However, we are always carry in our hearts and mind our history. <clears throat> we have, we carry with us the memories and pictures of our beloved town, memories and pictures that will always hold until the day of our return to Morfu. For 40 years, we, the refugees of Morfu, are fighting and claiming our right for the return to our town. In this struggle, we met with friends and supporters for our cause. What occurred in Cyprus in the tragic summer of 1974 can only be described as ethnic cleansing with 200,000 of people being displaced from their houses, deprived of their property, 
seeking refuge to the south part of the island. Our cultural, treasured, and national heritage have been destroyed or illegally exported and sold abroad. Our churches have been destroyed, converted into stable into stables or hotels. Our homes are now occupied by the settlers from mainland Turkey in an attempt to change the demographic character of our, of our island. Today we are here in London to express our great disappointment and protest for the position taken by the British Prime Minister, Mr. David Cameron, and his government on Turkey's recent illegal actions and aggressiveness. As you all know, Turkey's research vessel has entered and has violated the Cyprus exclusive economic zone. The action is provocative, illegal, and violates all international and European maritime laws and undermines the security and stability not only in Cyprus, but also the stability in the greater region. Despite this provocative illegal violation, Mr. Cameron and the British government decided not to support the EU demarch at the UN regarding Turkey's incursion into the Republic of Cyprus exclusive economic zone. We are greatly disappointed by this action of the British government. The Cypriot people expected the support and solidarity of the British government since Cyprus is an EU member state whose sovereignty and sovereign rights have been violated by the state that is candidate for EU membership. Turkey's occupation of Cyprus continues for 40 long years now, and unfortunately, Turkey still today works towards the division of our country and the recognition of two separate states. Under these circumstances, there cannot be a dialogue with Turkey at this moment and Turkey's Cypriot. We urge the international community and the British government in particular not to be tolerant and, so, and, and to exercise their influence in terminating <coughs> Turkey's illegal actions that make it possible for the reunification negotiations to resume. The people of Cyprus, Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots must live together in a state that all human rights and basic freedoms are respected and secured. Our children have the right and we have the obligation to offer our children a reunited and a prosperous Cyprus. Once again, we sincerely thank you, dear friends, member of the British Parliament. <clears throat> Can I just say, we keep hearing the words, uh, proud to be here, and it's, it's great and everything, but actually, we here in this building should be very, very proud of you, because we we'll learned the democratic process from your forefathers, and we've developed it, and some might say we've snaffled it up and turned it into something of our own. We call ourselves the mother of parliaments, but we're not a democratic nation at all. We're still a constitutional monarchy, so we haven't learned everything yet. And, uh, and yet we still realize and talk about the importance of the democratic process and the institutions where ordinary democratic people can try and argue their case and cause. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, a time when we need to be paying tribute to you rather than you to us in that regard, because just, uh, the soldiers from Greece uh, and the Middle East are still there active in the democratic process. And uh, until we get freedom in whatever country it is, particularly in the European area, then we're not a free and democratic uh, family at all. We're something somewhat different. And it's very important for us to do that uh, because democracy is quite special. It's also very hard, by the way. It's a very, very hard thing to achieve. But it's better than dick tyranny. 
It's certainly better than dictatorship. And it's the best idea so far we've got. There are all different forms of it. But it shows that uh, unless we're prepared to fight for it and work for it, it'll never apply. And it won't be very much use indeed, other than a term of endearment. So your being here today is very, very important indeed. Lots of people ask me about why I became involved in uh, the whole of the Cyprus issue. It was, of course, uh, another deceased member of parliament, actually, a very, very close friend of Tom, Tom and I, Tony Benn. I worked as Tony's head of office for seven years before I was a member of parliament. And uh, when I came into parliament, I said to Tony, tell me one piece of advice. I've given you lots over the year. Most of it's got you in trouble, but I would like it if you'd get me into trouble equally now by giving me just one ordinary piece of advice to help me out in this new role that I've got. And he said, look round for one international issue. And when you find it, stick th with it through bad and good, because it'll make you a bigger person. And that's what's important. And I went round every single one of all the international groups in Parliament. And uh, the, there were many in this place that people tend to get uh, different groups from all over the world and, uh, and uh, join them in friendship. And the last one I came to was, was uh, uh, the one on Cyprus. And I, I can remember vividly, even now, walking up to the top corridor in uh, the committee corridor upstairs and going along to, uh, to see uh, uh, what this meeting was about. And uh, there in the corridor were about 50 people. And another character was there. And he's sitting in the audience today, Carolis, uh, Mr. Snail. He's, he's in the uh, in the audience, and he said, "Come, we've got to." And I said, "We'll wait till all the other politicians turn up." And I, actually, they didn't because they're all away on different meetings and so on. So I was the only one there. We went in the meeting room. We had two hours on one of the best political meetings I've ever had in my life. And I actually didn't adopt Cyprus. Cyprus adopted me. And ever since then, I've been in trouble. And it's all about this one particular uh, cause. But I have stuck with it. And I've stuck with it not because it was just there and I went, went about it. I stuck with it because it was right. And the more I heard about it, the more I thought about it, it had all the elements of the democratic process and what we're supposed to stand up for. And I'll give you an instance. It talked about the missing. And I found it appalling that we had a huge amount of missing people, persons relatives of British citizens and uh, you know others that, that were friends of uh, Britain and had worked for the British Empire and Commonwealth before that and they were left without any knowledge of their loved ones without uh, in fact being deliberately kept away from any of the, the knowledge and information of that which is absolutely scandalous and it's still a scandal today as it was then but more important we had as I saw it an obligation we were a, a country under a Labour government that came into power and instantly said we recognise that the, uh, the nature of, uh, of, of Cyprus is such it should be a free nation. And we agreed to it in independence and a, an Act of Parliament came through, the Cyprus Act. And within that, all the elements were there for it to play a full and decent part in the Commonwealth, yes, but as a free, independent nation. So we were part and parcel of that whole operation to give independence through. All right, we're engaged in a, in a fracas and a war in the process of that. Incidentally, where Cypriots were, to, to, to say the least, quite advanced in, in the way they did. He took on the largest, strongest army in the world and defeated it with about 200 children and uh, one or two other elderly people, which I think is quite amazing. And they got independence then through the struggle which applied. Now, so it had all the elements. It, it had our responsibility for allowing or enabling the democratic process to be evolved and independence to be there, to be attached to the Cyprus people. And yet we were letting them down as a sovereign power which stepped back and away on the whims of other politicians who had a direct interest in Cyprus themselves, whether it be for uh, defence purposes or they saw it as part of their own homeland. They had other things, and we had enabled independence to be occurred. And then we stepped back away from this sovereign partnership we created, a family. We stepped back and said we weren't going to live up to our responsibility. So a combination of the missing, a combination of lack of responsibility, a combination also of anger that somebody should have the nerve to just invade a sovereign country, illegally, and occupy it 
fill it with troops and refuse to move and take people's property or land and don't even get them access to even look at it but to expel them from their own country. It was outrageous. And people in those days were outraged about China, they were outraged about the Soviet Union, they were outraged about all kinds of things throughout the world. But here we had an instance where there, there was a sovereign-based nation in our family who were just <coughs> left alone. Why? Because they were small. I remember uh, Lisa Ridis once uh, said to me, Alan, if, if it was oil, not olive oil, everybody would be here. And he was nearly right. And he still might have the, the whole elements of it himself because that may come about. His prediction all those many decades ago might, might actually be correct. Because it was simply that the world recognized Cyprus as just simply a tiny island as far as they were concerned. And in the shape of things, there was something over the water which had a much, much larger population and an access to a market which is all about capital that they preferred to be on the side of. And there's all the excuses in the world given that it was Kissinger playing games. The United States were self-interest. They wanted a listening station. They wanted, a, a, they wanted it to be like a static aircraft carrier. And they saw for the Middle East. And they saw Cyprus as probably a possible position where they could get a foothold in Europe or that southern part of Europe. Now, all of these things, what I'm telling this, it all came about out of self-interest not about the democratic process itself. The democratic process which we all fought for and actually sought to deliver and maintain. That's why we gave independence. We didn't give it up just as somebody else could come in and take command of it. We gave it up because we thought it was the right thing to do and it was the right thing for them to play a full part in our, in our family. And so, you know, the whole of the aspects of why I got involved uh, was there. And then shortly what followed, but as Andreas always does, he, he badges you until such a time that you end up doing things you can't even remember when you agreed to them. But uh, I found myself and my wife on our own, paid for ourselves, out in Cyprus, landing in all places, Paphos, which is only a very tiny airport then. And I got off, we got off the bus and we were, we were booked into a hotel in Limassol. And when we got on the bus, we ne neither of us been to Cyprus or anywhere like it in our lives like that before. We got on the bus and we left Paphos Airport and we went to Limassol, across the old road from Paphos. And it was like being on the moon. It was, it was desolate. It was the most inhospitable, crazy place that you ever seen. And I thought, my God, we, you know, we, we don't, I didn't even know we were going to be able to get back. So it was a, but what we had was three weeks of the best... Uh, introduction to a country we've ever had in our lives. The people were friendly, the people were kind, despite what we have done, our lack of responsibility to, to what occurred. We'd left them high and dry on their own and acceded to a foreign power who had no right to be there whatsoever. But we had a, an incredible relationship with the people there who were nothing else but friendly towards the British, which surprised me a little, little bit at that time. So when I came back, it was natural that Andreas built upon that and got me more and more involved with people like Tom and the rest of it. And what I say to, to uh, today is, is very, very simple that, uh, you know, the same problems that were there you know, after the invasion are still there today. We've tied up a few of them. We worked very hard through Tom and myself and others within Europe to ensure that we got European membership, which without doubt, I think Tom will say, if it hadn't been for Britain, if it hadn't been for a Labour government, it would never have occurred because there was a veto placed upon it by the Conservative government. And actually, there was even the United States, presidents of the United States, phoning in Tony Blair and John Prescott and urging them to actually lay off. And in fact, we, we instructed uh, Robin Cook to go to Helsinki. I was the minister in Helsinki. I was the person who actually signed the Helsinki Accord. But the Secretary of State was Ro actually Robert, Robin Cook. And he actually said, there will be no veto. There will be no veto on Cyprus joining the community by anybody who's not in the Council of uh, the European Union itself. So we got that through. We made a great step forward in respect of getting Cyprus accepted as a nation. And also the argument that there should only be one nation, not any div division of that nation whatsoever. So we, we got that, but yet we've still not made the rapid steps forward that we hope to, to get. Still the question of the missing is only very partially sorted out. We found a few hundred remains, 
and they're boxed up in, in a laboratory in the in the middle uh, of the of the of the green area. But actually, that's not enough. There were 1,619 altogether, and you know the 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 fact that. Uh, it, it remains a, a, a series of a massive series of unanswered questions that uh, you know we we have yet to get to the forefront because even in the graves that were found, even the remains that were boxed up and are still there, and, don't, and the stuff that's been written, up, I've seen those, I've been there, I've witnessed those those remains, and I would say 95% of them were all assassinated under the terms of the Geneva Convention. War crimes were committed on a massive scale, and that's only the. 400 or so that we've seen so far. The other three quarters are still outstanding. And it's an outrage that in a civil society, in a Europe that believes in freedom and human rights, that this still remains all those years later, still an outstanding topic. And it's, it's still what it was then, a bargain employ, a piece of the, the action to who will give what and where in exchange for this, that and the other. It is not bargainable. The exposure of what happened there, the, the history of what occurred, who was to blame, has to be discussed. And if you want any examples of, of that ever occurring elsewhere, look to South Africa. Look to South Africa, which had years and years and years of apartheid. When Mandela came out of prison, he said no violence, and he said there must be truth and reconciliation. And we want everything opened up. Everybody's got to tell everything. It's got to be examined. But everybody has the right to know where their loved ones is and what happened to them and who did it. And who did it. And if they admitted it, they went through it, there'll be reconciliation there. But if they weren't, it was a crime. And it's still that case today. But it hasn't applied in the case of Cyprus. And one can only wonder why. Is it still the old adage that I talked about a little while ago about the market across the sea, the 80 million pound in a marketplace that is more important than the two or three million across on the island? Yes, it is. It is in terms of trade. It is in terms of defense. And when you listen to what Cameron just said the other week, when he refused to actually allow the Cyprus government to refer a matter to the UN Convention Committee about the imposition that the Turks have took over credited area of the map for their, land, for their marine areas, for the oil and gas. He refused to even put a reference to that, saying it's not the right time to do it in respect of what's happening. Because we need Turkey's help over Afghanistan, we need Turkey's help over Iraq, we need Turkey's help over Syria, and it's not the right time to do it. Well, it's never the right time to do things like that. Never, ever the right time. But you always have to do it because it is always imperative that it's made an open door. And we can't allow, continue to allow the, uh, the, the, the use of Cyprus as some pawn in somebody else's international game. It's a member of the family of Europe. It's a full participatory member of it. And by the way, if Europe wants to think whether it's important or not, if you examine the, uh, the oil and gas field which has been found off Cyprus, it may be equal to what's in Saudi Arabia in terms of uh, liquefied gas. And if that's the case, it's got 120 uh, years of supplies for that part of the Mediterranean, parts of the north. And what is it? It's European oil. It's not Middle Eastern oil. It's European oil, our oil. So we're going to let that slip across the water into somebody else because somebody wants to come out and drill a hole and suck it all out of there. Well, no, no, no. We have international laws. It's no good the Turkish government turn around and say, we haven't signed the agreement. The agreement is laid down by the United Nations. It's very clear. And on every map you examine, and I've examined all of them, the marine area shows quite clearly that the whole of the areas are 10, 11, 12, and 13 uh, rigs inside of there. In all, all in the grid area are all in the Republic of Cyprus's area and can never, under any way you shape the map, be actually fixed to, to another area. There is a dilemma, of course. Oil and gas isn't drilled like that. It's drilled like that. So they could go nearby and drill in it anyway. But the thing of the matter is, Turkey's not participating in it. It's doing what it always does. It keeps on bargaining, negotiating, to try and get a situation in their favour. And they see the oil as an area where they can manipulate their own situation because they're talking at the present time about what's happening in Syria, what's happening in Iraq and the rest of it. They said, we will help, we'll take the refugees, we'll, we will allow people to be trained and go across there, but 
we don't want you to cause any stir in relation to what's happening in, in, in the Mediterranean. Well, that is not on. It's a different situation entirely. And what I'm saying all of these things for, because it be gets back to the common problem. The common problem being Cyprus itself. And Cyprus, as I say, is continually used as a pawn over and over again. Somebody once said to me, Cyprus, it's just an island. Britain is just an island. It's two, one small, one a bit larger, but we're only islands. And Cyprus is there about the size of one of our areas of the country anyway. And it's about time that the international community, the European uh, Parliament, the European Commission start to say enough is enough. We cannot do it. You have to act inside the family of common rules, as well as the right to, uh, to move freely throughout, uh, throughout uh, Europe, and that includes the north of the island. If anybody wants to go in the north of Ireland, I find it absolutely wrong that anybody should say nobody from Cyprus should be allowed to, to move from the south to the north without uh, jurisdiction from an illegal regime. I say that because I'm a citizen of Europe and if I want to travel anywhere in Europe, I can do so. And I see no way I can be restricted in the north. They say, well, you can do it, but you have to have your passport stamp. I find that an affront. It's an affront to a free regime in the whole of Europe. It's a free re regime to any European citizen. But mostly, it's a affront to any, any citizen of Cyprus that should be restricted from any part of their own island. So that's the reasons why I, uh, I uh, became involved in Cyprus and persisted. That and with the help from Mr. Karolis and one or two others. But the, 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 the thing is, just to, 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 to finish off on this, let's make it bland and, and say why you know people sometimes think Cyprus is important. You didn't say Cyprus could come in the European Union because a few of you said let's let's allow it to happen. It would be a good idea. They did it because it was in the interests of Europe. It was a small land as its own stock exchange. It could operate as a financial centre of the whole of Europe whether it like Monaco or places farther afield, Bermuda or wherever, it didn't. It has the best relations of anybody else in Europe, in Eastern Europe and Africa and the Middle East. We have lousy relationships mostly with, with all of them. And most of Europe has bad relationships with parts of that, particularly France, Holland uh, and Germany. It's a window in space. There are only six windows in the whole of the planet. The future of uh, the planet is communications. And it's one of the six windows into that. That's why they've got listen stations there. It's not by accident because it's over there and they can plant a few down and listen. It's because they can get direct communication from around space. You know, it's got all of these additives. It's got the second largest shipping fleet in the world. All of these things come together. So it was in Europe's interest to have this country inside the family. And having done that, they are now still playing the same game that the British government did following the invasion, where they step back and say, not at this time. Now is not the right time to persist. Well, I say this, they can't do that. That's a no answer. We have no right to be a family if we uh, do things like that. We have to be a bit more honest. We have to be a bit more forth, uh, forward. We have to keep saying to people, look, you cannot do that. We don't operate that uh, in, in, in Europe at all. We don't operate that in any member of the family country and we will not allow it to occur. We don't care what you're doing over there. We hope it's on our side. We think it will be because you're as frightened of ISIS as what we are. We, we're appreciative of it in, but we have a situation where they're making an excuse for that. Yet Cyprus helped Britain and Europe in Libya, helped us in Afghanistan, helped us in Iraq, and. Let me tell you this, I went to the hospitals in Cyprus. I went to the hospitals when people were being brought back from, uh, from Iraq and Afghanistan and actually uh, terrible, terrible injuries. And surgeons in Cyprus were operating on these people and saving their lives and saving their limbs at the same time. They did all of that, all of that at that time. And yet, when it comes to Cyprus, it comes to Cyprus it's just not at this time the right time. Well, I say no more. Please, please, please keep on struggling, keep on arguing, keep bringing it up with us and keep bringing it back again and again and again. And one day, one day, we will win. We will win because truth always, believe me, truth always prevails. Sometimes it takes a long time. Sometimes it doesn't. And that's gratifying. But if it takes a hundred years, 
not 40 years. We have to do it because it's in the interest of the democratic process. Thank you. And now, and now I'm going to introduce you to uh, a colleague of mine uh, who unfortunately is a Tory, but he's a hell of a lad. He's a really, he's a, he's a gentleman. And by the way, in all the years I've been in, in Parliament, as well as Tom, I've always had along, him alongside of me whenever the cause of sight was prevailed. Roger Gale. It's a, <clears throat> it's a huge pleasure to be able to welcome my mayor to the House of Commons and my town council, my district council. I regard it as an enormous honour to be a citizen of Morfu. Uh, I don't really know how to thank you. But it makes it very personal. <clears throat> and for me, this whole struggle has always been personal. It's never been about politics, really, or religion, or international power games, or all the other things that people play. It's been about people. When I first came into the House of Commons in 1983, a bloke called George Yerolamo, who some of you will have known, came to see me. I think he'd been here about three days. <clears throat> he took out his wallet and he took out a tatty photograph of a villa. And he said, you're my MP, I want you to get my home back. So, you know, fine, okay, you know, that's easy, we'll do that tomorrow, and then the day after that we'll do something else. Well, that was 32 years ago. George's wife died. George died. And they didn't get their home back. So I feel a great sense of failure in that, set, in, in, in that regard. <clears throat> but George and I went north, looked at his villa, somebody else digging a hole in his garden to put a swimming pool in. It wasn't much fun. But we went on from there up to Komi Kabir, which is where he was born and where he came from. And we visited George's family home, the place where he was born. And it was occupied by a fairly elderly Turkish Cypriot lady. And we banged on the door and weren't quite sure what sort of reception we were going to get. And she knew, she recognized him immediately. And seen him for about 70 years. She was five when he left the village. But she invited us in. We had coffee, we sat down, we had a chat. I say we had a chat, they had a chat. A separate chat, it went on for several hours. <laughs> um, in a dialect that I don't think even the Turks or the Cypriots would have, or the Greeks would have understood. And they were great friends. When George died, his son, his son and I, Nick and I, went back and we said we'd like to put a plate on the wall. No problem. So we put, a, you know, George Yerolamu was born here, the dates of his life and death on the wall. And I thought, again, as I thought at the beginning, isn't that what communities are about? Is it not absolute madness that we have people who fundamentally, if they were left to get on, without politicians getting in the way, would get on? They enjoy each other's company and speak each other's languages as they always used to. And each eat each other's food and drink each other's coffee and be friends. Now, I know that's a dewy-eyed view because I know there were problems between the two communities from time to time. But again, they were made, they were manufactured problems. They were problems caused by politicians. They weren't politicians caused by humans. We're not humans. 
Um, that's what it's always, for me, that's what it's always been about. So when, a long time ago, I went up in the Trudos and looked down, it's the only way at that time he could do it, at the whole district of Morfu, and looked at those olive groves and compared them with the apple trees, the orchards of Kent. I thought, yeah, I understand this. I understand why you want to go home. <clears throat> it's not bricks and mortar. It's the fields, it's the trees, it's the olive groves, it's the oranges, it's your churches. Sorry, our churches. It's the way that You need to be able to visit the burial places of your parents and your grandparents and your great-grandparents and your forebears. And I find this utterly inhumane. And that's why it gets to me. That's why so many... We don't have a huge Cypriot community in Margate. It's a very valuable community. I'll come on to that in a moment. But numbers don't matter. They don't matter to me, anyway. I don't care if it's one vote or ten votes or a hundred votes or three hundred votes or five hundred votes or five thousand votes. What matters is the principle. And the principle is that we have, in Cyprus, an occupied country. Now, that country is now a member of the European Union. That makes it even worse. It can't really be allowed, I think, to continue. Well, having broken the promise to George, not got his home back for him by the time that he went to the great kitchen in the sky, I broke another promise in October. This was a promise to myself. I promised myself that I'd never go to Morfu until I could go to a free Morfu. And over, well, I'm sorry, but I, I, I did break the promise because I was told, Andreas does everything in very quick order and gives you plenty of warning about everything, but I was told sort of about five minutes notice that I was going to be made a citizen of Morfu. So I thought you can't really be a citizen of somewhere you've never been to, visited, seen, whatever. So I better go. I asked Bambos, and Bambos said, yeah, it's okay, it's fine. Um, we understand, you go. I shan't go back, by the way, until it's free. But I went, and I went through the green line. I, wouldn't, I didn't take my British passport. Where's Alan gone? Oh, he's gone to find the caterers. Uh, he's doing a really important job. Um, <laughs> I took my Council of Europe passport. Now, there's a funny little document, which is about half a millimetre thick, which you can actually, if you are a member of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, you're supposed to be able to travel throughout Europe on. Well, I've tried it in a number of countries. I've actually come through Heathrow on it once. But I think the border guard was asleep. But I gave them my Council of Europe passport, which caused mayhem. Uh, and, a, and a degree of grief for, I have to say, the people whose car I was travelling in because it delayed them enormously, <coughs> because this passport went backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. Nobody could work out what it was. And anyway, finally, somebody fairly senior did come along and say, yeah, OK, fine, you can come in. I was prepared to make merry hell if, if they turned it down, but they didn't. Somebody got cute enough to let me in and perhaps quite significantly let me out as well. Um, so I went in and of course we had a look around and of course some of my dearest friends from Morfu showed me their houses that other people were living in. Some of whom, whose occupants, had treated them very well and tried to preserve family photographs and respect the property and the furniture and everything that was not theirs, and others who frankly couldn't give a damn. But either way, 
I wouldn't like anybody living in my house without my permission. And that's basically what it comes down to. And again, it's a human factor. It was a very humbling experience. Uh, we did drive past the cemetery. And I don't believe that desecration of anybody's religious artifacts and monuments has any place in any civilized society. And if that was my granddad's grave, I would... I would be spitting blood. And I was astonished. No, I wasn't actually, because I know the people well, but I was deeply respectful of the dignity that was shown by the people who were looking at their graveyards, their families' graveyards. So it's very personal, this. It's not to do just with politics. But the solution has to be political. Um, we said a lot over that weekend in Nicosia about Morfu. And I've concentrated about Morf on Morfu because I've been to Kyrenia uh, and I've been to other places in the north, but Morfu is the place that I suppose I focused or had my attention focused on. But of course it applies to the whole of Cyprus, it applies to Famagusta. It applies to towns and villages that, whose names I can't even pronounce. But every single one of those places, communities, old schools, churches, graveyards, is part of somebody's, some family's heritage. That's what we have to address. This has been going on for 40 years. Last weekend before last, I was <coughs> privileged to be invited to the 50th anniversary of the Cypriot community in, in, in East Kent. I was about to say Margate, but it was actually the whole of East Kent. And um, I told them some of what I'm telling you. Some of those people obviously came out entirely voluntarily uh, to establish businesses in the seaside towns of Britain before the invasion. And it's not surprising, therefore, that others followed where they were displaced to their families in Britain. And they've made our country, your country, which is right. It's just as right as me making Morfu part of my country. And I feel part of that. And I've been, I've been allowed to feel part of that. And the Cypriot community in Margate has made a huge contribution, totally out of proportion to all of its size and political weight. Huge contribution to the life the, the life of the village of Margate, a town probably about the same size actually as Morfu. They've contributed enormously. Yeah, sure, in you know, money certainly, in taxes and all the rest, but much more importantly than that, in terms of culture and public service, we had I've got to find another one. We, we have one Tory um, councillor in Margate. He's the only Greek Cypriot who's ever been a councillor in Margate, but it was a Tory. We need more, but we need more from all... It's not, this isn't a party political issue. We need more from both sides of the community. Well, I <coughs> spoke to this gathering in the presence of the, my dear friend, Archbishop Gregorius, the Archbishop of Thyatira, and you'll be pleased to know I didn't try and speak in Greek. There were one or two presents who heard me try uh, in, in, in Nicosia on the eve of the Morfu rally. Um, Harry Sophocles was kind enough to say that he could actually understand what I was saying. <clears throat> that was about as good as it got, and I was speaking his language, or at least I thought I was. 
Um, we do have to solve this. David Liddington, uh, the European minister, was in Cyprus yesterday and today. I'm not sure if he's back yet. He may be flying back now. <clears throat> made it very clear indeed that Cypriot hydrocarbons are Cypriot hydrocarbons and nobody else's. There are lines that have been drawn. But this cannot go on. We cannot have, Alan and I can't share a Council of Europe, weak, vacillating body though it is, with people who are representatives of a country that has invaded another sovereign state. Oh, and by the way, I'm not talking about Russia and Ukraine. We're asked to do that as well. <coughs> but this can't continue. It's going to continue for a bit. But what I want you all to understand is that so far as this Member of Parliament is concerned, this is not a party political issue. It's barely even a political issue. It is a very, very personal issue. I want to see this resolved in the interests of the, all of the people who have a right to live in peace in Cyprus. Turkish Cypriots as well as Greek Cypriots. I want this problem put to bed in a way that is fair and just, allows for the freedom of movement, the freedom of employment, the freedom of domicile under a democratic government that is properly elected, that allows all of the people of Cyprus to participate in the European Union as the whole island, not part of it, and we need to remember this, is part of the European Union. And by the way, I'm a Eurosceptic, but that isn't the issue here. The issue here is that your home, your island, now my island, has a right to be a full and in full member of the European Union. Properly represented, properly elected, in its entirety, not in bits. And all I can say to you, again on a completely non-party basis, is that people like Alan, myself, some of our Liberal Democrat friends, will continue to carry the torch that people like Tom, bless him, carried for a long time, for as long as it takes. But there will be a solution, and it will be a fair solution. And one day, we, not just you, we, will go home. Mm -hmm. Now, I have some very, very good news for you that uh, one stop wedding ink have turned up with the food, but it'll take them about five or ten minutes to get, the, get the, them all here, um, for which we're very, very grateful. We've had a very difficult uh, route down to Westminster from uh, uh, what is it? Uh, Speaker's Corner. Speaker's Corner. And what we'll do, we'll, we'll, we'll take a few questions if people would like to, to ask anything, and uh, we'll try our best to, to answer them. So who's the first? Come on, somebody, you're never short in answering questions ever. <coughs> Can I say, and I'm sure Alan and Roger, I speak for everyone here, to really thank Alan Mill, Roger Gell, and all of their parliamentary colleagues for keeping in this House of Commons the issue of Cyprus yeah. alive. Yeah. Commonwealth Office, there is a Cyprus desk, and they follow very, very closely what members of Parliament like these two and other colleagues continually present, irrespective of the party in government, the injustice, as both of them have said this evening, after 40 years, that still exists in the democratic Republic of Cyprus and 
As we, and the question I would like to ask both of them is this, two short questions. We are six months away from a general election. What do you think, and two of you represent the two major parties in this country, what do you think will be the attitude of your parties because I know very much what Roger was saying to him and to me, it's not a political issue, but politics does play a major role. So what do you think will be the stance that will be taken by the major parties on the issue of Cyprus? And the other question is, I've always believed that one of the major players in seeking to end the injustice that Cyprus faces is the United States of America. Now, the Vice President was in Cyprus some time ago, Joe Biden. Where does Alan and Roger see the role of the US? <coughs> well, let's, let's take the last bit first. Um, I can recall a um, long time ago when dear Robin Corbett was still with us, going to Washington and seeing various people on the Hill and going into the State Department and being made promises. I can't even remember, actually. It almost doesn't matter who the President of the United States was because they all say the same thing as far as Cyprus is concerned, first of all, we have to get out the atlas and look and see where it is. Um, and, and then it's sort of, oh, yes, well, it's a bit close to the Middle East. Uh, and, oh, yes, well, um, we've got the sort of buffer state called Turkey between us and the Muslims. You know, us is 7,000 miles away in Washington, but never mind. Yeah, there's a buffer state there, and that'll, that'll keep us safe. Um, We've, we've heard promises, so we're blue in the face. We've heard promises from Bill Clinton. We've heard promises from George Bush Jr. We've heard promises from Barack Obama. And frankly, sweet nothing has happened. And I think part of that has to be the, the real politic, and we, we do have to recognize this, of the politics of the Middle East and the danger that is rearing its head again, not for the first time in Syria and Iraq, and, uh, and they feel they need Turkey. So I don't suppose we're going to get vast support from the United States at this precise moment. But, cynically, I suppose, hydrocarbons make a difference. And suddenly there's a factor that wasn't there before, was it? Well, it was, we just didn't know about it. Um, and it may just be that they'll pay a bit more attention. So far as the party politics is, of this is concerned, as I said, I have studiously not, when I was um, more heavily involved in party political groups in this house, the one that I fought like hell not to allow to become party political was the all-party group for Cyprus. Because I believe unless we take a cross-party approach to it, we're not going to help in the way that we, the United Kingdom, have a duty to help. We are a guarantor power. We need to remember that. And successive foreign ministers and successive ministers for Europe in successive governments and of successive parties have tried and paid lip service but not actually done enough. Now, I happen to believe that David Liddington who is far too Europhile for my taste, is nevertheless, where Cyprus is concerned, doing quite a good job. And I also happen to believe that the current president, Nikos, is doing quite a good job. But it does take two sides to tango. And it doesn't matter how much goodwill the Foreign Office from the United Kingdom shows, and it doesn't matter how much goodwill the <coughs> president of the Republic of Cyprus shows, if there's no goodwill on the other side, it's not going to happen. So, somehow, 
and I think Tom is, I mean, Tom is, in, is right in the sense that America could do a lot more. But I'd question Tom at the moment whether they're going to. At the moment. Doesn't mean they never will. This precise moment, I'm not sure they will. So I think we have to look to the Foreign Office. We have to look to the government of Cyprus. And we have to seek to find not any compromise at any price, because that is not what any of us want. But we do need to try to move this forward. Um, there are people, possibly some in this room, who take a very hard line indeed, who say, over my dead body, well, that can be arranged. Um, you know, don't give an inch. We've given far too much already. That is certainly true. We have given far too much already. So now we need something in return. But this does have to be about negotiation. It does have to be about talking. Uh, which is why I've always tried to maintain a reasonably low rhetoric on this. It is, as I've said, very personal to me. But that's not enough. There has to be a sensible negotiated solution. Which probably, actually, at the end of the day, will come back down to hard cash. Which is bizarre, but we can get the troops out of Cyprus. That can happen. I mean, that's, that's a physical reality, a physical possibility. Get the British troops out of Cyprus if you want to. We can get the Turkish troops out of Cyprus. We can get the modest number of Greek troops out of Cyprus. But there are people now, whether we like it or not, who settled in Cyprus in the last 40 years, who've had children who are now born in Cyprus, or they're Cypriots. They live there, that's their home, it's their only home, it's the only place they know. Now it's a bit like us saying, like, you know, I won't name a particular politician, but there are one or two at the moment, who will say, yeah, we're going to send everybody home. Yeah? <laughs> You serious about this? You're not. You know damn nicely you're not, and that's dishonest. So we have to reach an accommodation, literally, in this case. And that's only going to be done by politicians and by negotiation. But the really tricky bit, actually, now is property. There are some Cypriots who want to go north and south. There are Turkish Cypriots who've got homes in Larnaca, uh, which have been well looked after, by the way who want to go home, and will go home one day, I hope. And there are some people who've been displaced from the north to the south who want to go home. To Famagusta, to Morfu, of course. Particularly to Morfu, but to Kyrene. That's possible, because those are homes. But when you start talking about the vast areas of land that have been developed, and who pays for what, and how much it's worth, and how much the buildings on it are worth, and should they be there at all? No, they shouldn't but they are, then it's going to come down to shed loads of money. Cyprus doesn't have that money. Turkey's not going to pay that money. So maybe, Tom, if the Yanks can't do anything else, they might just put up a lot of money to help to buy our way out of the problem. The, the first uh, uh, real answer is that our party uh, are committed to, uh, in terms of the UN, uh, situation in relation to Cyprus is a, a free Cyprus, United Cyprus, longer terms laid down. We mentioned that in our 1997 manifesto. We've done it since, and I'm told that we will maintain that at the next general election. And there's going to be some words in the manifesto to that regard, to repeat <coughs> what has gone before. In relation to the American situation, it's true Joe Biden's probably the best uh, person we ever had in the White House in relation to the Middle East. He has a very good uh, uh, perspective on, on the Middle East generally, in particular Palestine, but also he ra he's raised issues on, on Cyprus. But you know, in this world you have people who are addicted to heroin and cocaine and tobacco. The Americans are addicted to oil and gas. It, it, it swirls around the whole of their, every bean in the, every part of their economy. And whereas they, they don't need as, as much now as they thought they would have to get from the Middle East, because they've got vast reserves being found off the South American uh, coast, they still play it because it's so valuable. To them, it's gold dust, and they can't get away from it. 
and I've been in Cyprus quite recently, and for the last two years, you can't move without bumping into an oil mine somewhere in, in, in the Republic. They're everywhere. And they're already doing what they did to Britain uh, in the uh, 70s, 60s and 70s, when we found North Sea oil. They're filling places up, and they're beginning to negotiate as a family, internationally. The family of oil and gas operatives are already there, the BPs, the Texaco, the, the SO, they're all, all, they're all in there. They're all in negotiating, not only to get the oil and gas out, because when it comes out, it will land in two or three places and be refined and then shipped around the world. It will be shared as a family from how much they get in out of the respective oil drills, and they'll do it like that. And that's the danger for Cyprus. The danger is that they'll do to Cyprus what they did to Britain in North Sea Oil. They'll give us a lousy price. They'll tell us all what we have to accept, this, that, and the other, and they'll prove them off the top in a major, major way. And that's what to be guarded against. And to be fair, Cyprus is looking to that, although the present president, I don't think he's got a total grip on it yet, but he's going to have to face more up to it as this whole rig question and the grid and the noble oil predictions. I mean, let me just tell you, 10, 11, 12, and 13 on the grid, noble oil predictions and all the sums that they've done there have predicted massive, massive reserves of the most important thing of all in, in uh, carbon wealth, which is liquefied gas. There's a, a, a huge shortage of liquefied gas all the way around the planet. There's lots of oil, lots of gas, fracking, all the rest is coming forward. But liquefied gas is the most purest uh, uh, and uh, uh, more expensive than all. And it's got vast quantities there. And they say in 120 years, so that's more than Saudi Arabia. That is a huge kind of problem, with the main field being within the grid area. And you can't get around, Turkey can't get around that grid area. They can make all kinds of, they can send ships in there, they can drill, they can do this, that, but someday there has to be a solution, which has to be a UN solution. And at the moment, they're, they're doing all that. As far as the solution in Cyprus is concerned, let me just say that Roger and I, neither of us, have any right to be involved in the negotiations for that whatsoever, and we will keep our colleagues away from that. We will say what is right and what is wrong, but we won't take part in the negotiations for that. Because what Cypriots do to settle their affairs is a Cypriot matter. And it's, it's the Republic's uh, matter. The only one constituted government of Cyprus is the Cyprus Republic. And the people in there, all over the island, proof of that, under a legal body, must actually determine what is a solution. Whether it's land prices, whether it's compensation, <coughs> whether it's something else, it's theirs. It's nobody else. It's not Americans, not Britons, not French, not Americans, not G Germany or anybody else. It's actually a Cyprus issue. And I think we should look at that as a, as a thing where people are trying to engage us in another area which will slow us all down and move away from a solution. Because I just have to say this, look, we think sometimes of the element of land and property and everything. Have everything been wrong in the north? Well, it isn't. There's a hell of a lot of land in the south, which is Turkish land. And it's got huge quantities of investment on that. Greek. Greek and international investment. So there's all of those things that have got to be drawn together. And whoever does it will be the legitimate government of the island. They'll do it in, 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 through their parliament, through their negotiations, uh, whatever it is. Our job is to make sure they do just that. Not to say, well, you shouldn't do that, you should do that. You say, we'll enable you to get to a spirit of solution. And that's our job. Because, you know, I'm a citizen of Morford, but I'm not a citizen of the Republic. I can't vote in the Republic. I can vote in, in Britain, and I can hope somebody gets elected in Morford, but uh, you know I can't vote in that. So it's not our role, and our role is just to, to keep the cause going so that the democratic process prevails, freedom of movement, freedom of expression, freedom to govern is given back to Cyprus and not kept away from it, which is quite wrong, quite illegitimate. The, the current, uh, Roger is saying, there's a legal regime who's illegally invaded and illegally occupying the island. Whether that's in Ukraine, him and I are absolutely as one on the Ukraine and Russia, absolutely down the line, what's going on? There are faults on both sides, but we know where we are both together. It's exactly the same in Cyprus as it was in Kuwait or anywhere else. If it's wrong there, it's going to be wrong in Cyprus. And our job is to put that right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Mr. Mayor, 
it's very frustrating for us to hear that Mr. Cameron said it's not the right time to disturb Turkey. This is what I understood from what you were saying in this speech, uh, in this place today. So what remains for us as Cypriots then to do? Sit there and just feel disappointed because that's the attitude of the British government at this time? What can we do? I mean, we are so frustrated that we hear this all the time. Don't disturb Turkey because it's the, it's the position now that everybody needs Turkey for, for all these other problems in the Middle East. So what, what can we do then as a nation, as Cypriots? Let me first of all just point to Roger and say, if it had been Blair, we've had the same kind of lack of action, lack of purpose, lack of movement forward. They're all the same, some of them. They forget from whence we come and where we're supposed to be heading in what direction. The reality is Cyprus has been let down because it's seen as the bit part player at the end of the line. They look into the major players in that, whether it's for finance, whether it's for de defence, individual present circumstances like Iraq or whatever. The reality Cyprus is just used as a bit part play. What we've got to do and what you've got to do, you've got to keep pressing us. That's what you keep doing and people like us. Over and over and over again, we've got to try and press other people on top of that, reminding them it's absolutely wrong and no part of any kind of solution we should have in mind. We have to say we can't go down that path. Just because they're small, they're not important. Every citizen in Europe is as important as the other one if they're a member of the family of Europe. We have to stick by that and we have to fight for it. And it takes a long time. As I said to you right at the beginning, democracy is bloody hard. It really is. A dictatorship, dead easy. Just tell our people to get on with it. Tyranny, you just kill people. You get your way. Democracy, you've got to argue it. You invented it. You gave it to us. We're trying our best with it. But it's hard. And that's what we're going to keep doing. <laughs> right, who's next? We'll have one more. One, Somebody's yeah. going to do it. Yeah. Yes. yes, right in front of you. Uh, my name is Domestikas. Uh, I have the privilege to make the acquaintance of uh, Mr. Rene in Kent two weeks ago where we celebrated the establishment of the Greek Orthodox community with 50 years of the establishment. Mm -hmm. It was a privilege to, uh, to meet such a fervent uh, supporter of this cause and now it's a privilege to meet you as well. So we all realize that this, this has been um, a tragedy for such a long time. And I would say that there are very few parts of the world which, which are so heavily militarized like the, 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 the occupied part of Cyprus. So my question would be, I know that Mr. Gale um, is, is active in the Council of Europe. So my question would be, uh, and we all know that Turkey has been condemned on the, for, for a series of cases for its behavior over there. So do you think that over there there are means to access some pressure uh, against Turkey so <coughs> they finally abide by their rulings? That has been issued over there in, in, in various cases. Um, I'm. <clears throat> um, I think we have to use all the levers we've got uh, in every forum that there is, and the Council of Europe is one. I don't think either Alan or I would claim that it is the most dynamic body in the world, but it is a forum. It has a convention. It has rules, and Turkey is breaking those rules, as Russia is breaking those rules. But then, if we're brutally honest, so are half the countries in Europe. The member states of the Council of Europe are detaining people for years without trial, in clear breach of the Convention. Nobody does anything about it. I don't want to embarrass any, but Malta's one country, France is another, Spain is another. I'm told that Greece are one or two, too. Um, and for all I know, we probably do. So. It's a little hard for anybody to preach. And everybody falls back on the European Court of Human Rights and the European Court says this is what has to happen and we're going to dictate this and we're going to dictate that and we hand down the doctrine and the tablets come down from the mountain and we all have to do as we're told. And the fact of the matter is that we all do what we want to do 
And if it suits us, we'll do as we're told, and if it doesn't suit us, we don't. And the Russians certainly don't, and the Turks certainly don't. And up to a point, neither do we, if we're honest. <coughs> um, so I think it's limited in its capability. But that said, it is there. And it is important, actually, that the United Nations, which we maybe, Alan mentioned them, but I think only once, and I didn't mention them at all. But the UN resolutions are important, and they're there in black and white. We know what they say. Turkey's in clear breach of the UN resolutions. Turkey is in clear breach of the Council of Europe resolutions and the Convention. Um, Turkey is not yet a member state of the European Union, but the European Union clearly has an interest uh, because Turkey has associate status. Well, I don't notice the European Union demanding very much in return. So the answer to your question is, is there one key to this? No, there isn't. But there are a number of keys to a number of locks, and we have to use them all. Um, if I wanted to be slightly mischievous, and I now will be, because I know you well enough, we have met before, albeit briefly. I don't want a Greek flag flying over Cyprus. I certainly don't want a Turkish flag flying over Cyprus. I want a Cypriot flag flying over Cyprus. That's why we're all here. <laughs> I have a community in my, in my uh, Greek, Greek Cypriot community, and there's only in my area, I tell them there's 700, but there's about 70 families, and uh, there's about 200 in total in the whole of the area. But they have a school, they have a church, <coughs> they have a community centre, and it's very, very active. And uh, I would imagine, you know, when I talk about democracy being difficult, it's like that when you go to places like Margate and you throw the cross in the sea. You always find it, don't you? You always find the gold cross. You never lose that. You don't in my area anyway, because we threw it in the swimming pool. We're 88 miles from the sea, so you know we always find it. It, it never. So democracy is always there. It's just a question of getting it out. But you know the the Council of Europe is important. It's an institution. Remember how it was formed? It was formed by De Gaulle and uh, Winston Churchill and all them people all those years ago, 1949, and the establishment by 1953, and it was a pre-run of the EEC, which became the EU and the EP, European Parliament, and so on. And the pressure to allow Cyprus into the family of Europe actually came much more through the Council of Europe than it did through EP and yeah. EU. I mean, particularly people like Tom Cook, month after month, every, every time they came in front of the Council of Ministers, they made up of either the ministers or the ambassadors in the EU, we at them every meeting, time to time, what's happened about this, that, this, on Cyprus. And in the end, they had meeting after meeting, and we pointed out in particular case, Lozidic's case, the Lozidic's case. Very, very important when they established that, they had the right of return of their property. Not only that, they could charge rent for not being allowed to have it. And it went back. Now, the Turks <coughs> thought, as usual, well, get out of that, we'll just pay them off. But the payment wasn't for the property. It was for the rent. And so it was never paid off. The principle of the ownership of the property and the land is still there. It was established in two or three cases ever since that particular... Well, the freedom of movement throughout, throughout Europe, and particularly in the North, actually has come from the council. That's where it all started and went forward. So it is an important institution. I mean, the right to join, as I've said, is very, very clear. It came throughout via the Council of Ministers. It goes to the Council of Europe, it goes from the Council of Europe, it goes to the Council of Ministers, and that's where it's decided, and comes back to the respective uh, Commission and the individual states. And then it's decided, well, when you get it month after month, year after year, applying, people actually understand the importance of it. And Tom, probably more than anybody here tonight, was there throughout the whole, whole of that period arguing for that. So it is important, and we have to use it for that. All this thing about the right to roam, in the north, there's no northern Cyprus. There's one Cyprus, and there's the north of Cyprus. And people's right to roam and to go over those borders and walk freely, and actually go into a law office and claim their property back, as they could do. The movement from uniform to civil, from army to police, 
needs to occur. All of that needs to change. That's what happens in a, in a civil society. And that will come through arguments which are made first at the Council of Europe, Council of Ministers, EU, EP, all of that case. So it's no one thing. It's a group of things. And uh, as I say, it's a dialectic. It's a, it's a wide area. And I, I just referred one more time, promise not to mention it yet. Democracy is hard. It really, really is hard. You've got to keep at it over and over again. Because if you don't, it disappears. If you suddenly turn around and start to take advantage, you'd be a bit selfish. But actually, when you're living in a democratic society, somebody's there to say, hang on a minute. And he goes back and stuff. So it's hard. But you have to keep doing it. That's how we'll win. OK. Thank you. I think you all need a drink. Just by the by, in case anybody took offence at the fact that I said I didn't want the Greek flag flying over Cyprus, I happen to be also the chairman of the All-Party Group for Greece. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a big thank you to our, to our very good friends, Sir Alan Mill and Sir Roger Gay. We have to give the apologies for, from uh, our very good friends who couldn't be with us tonight. And first of all, our very, very good friend of Cyprus and Morfu, Teresa Villiers. She couldn't be in Ireland and here tonight. Mike Free and the others who had constituency meetings meaning that they were in their constituency tonight. Mike Freer, David Barrows, Matt Gofford, Jeremy Corpin, David Lamy. They have meetings with their constituents and they are not with us tonight. Stephen McKay, Jim Sheridan is away, Stephen Pound, uh, Lord Dykes, Lord Tubbs, Stephen Twig, the MP, and uh, the president of the National Federation, uh, Peter Drushodis, due to a foreseen circumstances, and the president of BOMAC, Andreas Papaibribidis, and Jimmy Hood. But I assure you, I assure our good friends, that the speech of the mayor of Morpho <coughs> tomorrow morning will be sent to this and the others who were invited by email. Thank you very much for your help and support. <laughs>